I made my first score as a writer at age 10 when I won an essay contest. I was at the time living in my hometown, Gloversville, New York, and I wrote an essay about Sir William Johnson, who was a colonial figure in that area. And I remember vividly my opening was, strong, brave, honest, these words describe <laughs> Johnson. And I won $10 worth of World War II saving stamps. Subsequently, I always had it in, in mind that I'd, I wanted to write, and I came into writing full-time through a back door, kind of a bastard form of writing. I was a, a political speech writer for many, many years. I wrote speeches for Governor Nelson Rockefeller and subsequently for Vice President Nelson Rockefeller. In the back of my mind was always the itch to be writing in my own right. And uh, it, it was a long, long time in coming. The first time I ever saw my byline on a piece of writing, I was 42. I'd been speech writing forever but my name was not on the speeches. Uh, and um, I wrote a piece for American Heritage magazine, and that was enormously satisfying. And then I, uh, I kept my day job for a long time, but I was just dying to get out of that. I wanted to, I'd be, I wanted to be a writer full time. I knew the, the, the odds were formidable. Finally, uh, Governor Rockefeller's days in public service were about to end. Uh, this was 1974. He um, was retiring uh, back to uh, public life, and I had to make a big decision. What was I going to do? Was now the time to take the big plunge? One thing helped me, and that is my wife had a good job. <laughs> she was with the American Association of Retired Persons, and we were living in Washington at the time. So we took this gamble, and... Um, got my first contract, wrote my first book, which was a Civil War book, and have been lucky enough to stay in the game ever since. I think the, the, the serious application uh, to writing began when I was a college student here at SUNY, and um, <clears throat> almost by, by chance there was a, a fortuitous combination. I loved history. I was set on fire uh, with history by a professor here by the name of Harry Price, long since gone. And I, was an, and I was an English minor, and I wound up writing history. So I, I could not have had better preparation, but it wasn't because of any foresight on my part. It just worked out comfortably that way. Um, in the back of my mind was always, how do I make my way as a writer? In the meantime, I went to work in the governor's office after coming out of the Navy. This was 1954. Uh, writing for gov uh, working for Governor Averill Harriman with only the most marginal uh, uh, connection to writing. I wrote a booklet on consumer protection. Uh, Harriman lost the election of 1958 to Nelson Rockefeller. I went abroad, and I was with the U.S. Information Agency in Brazil and in Argentina or occasionally I wrote a press release or something of that one. And these, these things always turned me on. Then I came back and I became Rockefeller's speech writer. And I, most of my assignments were tolerable, uh, but there's just a, a vague dissatisfaction of being a speech writer. Every once in a while, the governor would be uh, dedicating or visiting a historical site. Once it was the Battle of Oriskany, and I would jump on these assignments, and they would be soul food for me. Uh, I remember another occasion when the governor was going off for his summer vacation in Maine, and for once I had no speeches to write for two or three weeks. I left my suit in the closet, my ties, put on corduroys and a flannel shirt, and wrote this piece for American Heritage, American Heritage magazine. And I said, this is it. This was an epiphany. This, this is what I've got to do with my life. And eventually managed to make it work out, along with just some good fortune. 
American heritage was wonderful basic training for what I wanted to do because heritage wanted stories with a great deal of vividness and that you are there quality. They were not very much interested in academic history. They wanted the emphasis to be on story in history, which is what I liked to read and which uh, was what I hoped to be able to write. So I did, uh, while, I did this as moonlighting while I was a speechwriter. I wrote a couple of pieces for them. And I, and I saw what, the, what they wanted, and that set me on my course. I wanted to write what's essentially narrative history. If it was a biography, I wanted my reader to feel that he or she was walking alongside my subject, could hear the sound of this person's voice, could sense what was going on in that mind. Uh, if, I, if I aroused uh, that reaction in the reader, I had succeeded. The same, the same way with the, the, the historical books that I've done, Gettysburg, Nuremberg, Infamy on Trial, uh, most recently the book I just completed, 11th month, 11th day, 11th hour, on the end of uh, World War I. Again, I want to be in the trenches in World War I. I want to be going with Pickett's men towards Cemetery Ridge at Gettysburg. Uh, and sometimes, and I don't, I don't want to, to make this come out immodestly, but what, what I've been often impelled by is to write a book that I wanted to read and I couldn't find it. For example, I wrote uh, a book on Nuremberg in the narrative style. I had read several books on Nuremberg. They all read like legal treatises. And I thought well, there had to be just powerful, pounding emotion going on in that courtroom. You're trying these villains who've been responsible for staggering numbers of, uh, of deaths, horrors that are almost unmatched in the 20th century, and it was missing. So I wrote the book I wanted to read. I uh, r remember very vividly uh, the economic terror to begin with of jumping from a uh, steady government paycheck every couple of weeks mm -hmm. to being on my own. And uh, I finally made the leap. I, got, I, I was so naive that I got uh, a contract from the Viking Press to a, do a book on, on Gettysburg. And uh, then I got a, another one, and I said to my wife, well, I'm on my way. I got a a contract to do a book about World War II espionage. And so with two daughters approaching college age, I said, well, they're offering me a $35,000 advance. I don't need a job. Oh, only in retrospect did I realize how close I came to be hitting, being hit by an economic Mack truck. And the, the most vivid memory of that period, I, I had gone to New York to see a publisher. And that night, I was staying in a friend's apartment and I had a dream. And my dream was that I was sitting in Central Park. And a guy came along and he sat down near me. And he had three days stubble. He's wearing a jacket from one suit and a pants to another. He's wearing a, a kind of dingy dress shirt, but it's got a, a very sooty collar. He's got shoes on, but no socks. He's a derelict. And I said to him, uh, Hi, nice to see you. He said, uh, uh, nice to see you. I said, well, what do you do? He said, I'm a freelance writer. <laughs> I woke up in a cold sweat. <laughs> My interest in writing about Gettysburg, in, in a sense, conformed to this impulse of, of wanting to, to, to write the book I couldn't find. There, obviously, there were many good books about Gettysburg, but there was a question that gnawed at me. I, I couldn't understand what had propelled ordinary Americans, North and South, to, to go at each other with such ferocity that it, pro it produced casualties that have been unmatched since that war. And I would try to turn it around a little. I would say, can I conceive of the states on the eastern seaboard going to war against the states on the west coast with such fierceness, with such a will to kill.
And, and I said, now I've got to find out what propelled these people. And uh, that, that was the seed for my book on Gettysburg. I think when, when you're a, a writer of uh, nonfiction, as I am, that uh, you, you may be talented, you hope you are, but there is also an element of serendipity. There's also an element of luck. Although uh, I, I have, a, I have a, uh, an epigram that hangs on the off, uh, office wall of my home, which says, the harder I work, the luckier I get. But sometimes you do just you get lucky breaks. Um, I'd always wanted to write something about World War II. I grew up in that era. It was very important to me. And I had uh, made a friend at the National Archives, and I let him know that I was looking for such a story. He came to my office. At this point, I was speechwriter for the Vice President of the United States, and he came to my office, and he dropped a big black three-ring binder on my desk, and he said, in there is the just classified account of the OSS, America's first spy organization, the Office of Strategic Services. He said, you're the first one to get a copy. He said, take a look at the German operations. I wasn't quite sure what he meant, uh, but I, w I went into this binder and I found something that absolutely astonished me and had never been published, had never been touched before, and that was that during World War II, the United States had penetrated Nazi Germany with secret agents, slipping them across the border, parachuting them in. And we had agents in 200 German cities. And this was not like landing uh, agents in France where you had the resistance movement, you had safe houses, you were, had people who were as eager uh, to drive the Germans out as we were. And, uh, Germany was in the iron grip of the Gestapo, and yet we had, had this fairly successful operation which hadn't been written before. Well. I suppose that was a lucky break, and I, and, I, and I just seized upon it to write Piercing the Reich. Uh, 